going to call out Bob Mangan now. He has to leave. We're having a club meeting. Uh, he has quite a bit to say about what we're doing in the um, in, in the fundraising committee. I just want to know, did you listen to Johnny Hoy? I did. I did listen to Johnny Hoy. Uh, Dave gave me a CD to, to listen to that they uh, would like us to consider uh, performing at our fundraiser, Celebrate Community. And uh, my wife liked the CD so much, she said, do we get to keep it? I said, I think so. I think you get to keep this CD. It's going to end up in her car, Dave, <laughs> one way or another. Anyway, um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the fundraising committee, where we stand in the process and, and, and the progress we've made so far um, in the committee and what our plans are. Nothing's definitely cast in stone just yet. Uh, it's more or less considerations what we're looking at. Um, uh, our, uh, our committee met and we thought that, gee, uh, what, went, what, what did we did right? What did we do right last year? And what can we bring forward this year from the things that we did right? What went wrong last year? What were some of our challenges last year? How can we overcome them this year? So this year what we've done is we, we thought, first of all, uh, where, where do we want to have it? And we thought, well, maybe we should consider coral seafood. Look at the space around you, how big this space is in this room. Uh, this, was, this is probably just as large as the space we, we uh, occupied at the DCU Center. And when we considered looking at this space, we also thought about our members and the ease of coming here. The parking is free, it's right outside here. The DCU Center is a little bit cumbersome to get to. Uh, you've got to park in a parking garage somewhere, pay for parking, then you're going to get across those streets and up the escalator to the room where we, where we had our fundraiser. It would be uh, easier for our members and anyone else coming to, to this event to have it here in this location. Um, another, another plus side to this is that it holds 250 people to 300 people. And there's plenty of room around us, as you can see, there's, there's enough seating here for 250 people in this room now. And there'd be plenty of room for a check-in table and all of the uh, uh, auction items along the wall. We can line the wall with all the silent auction items. So I think that this, this space would accommodate our needs. Um, and, the, and the food prices are, are uh, relatively uh, lower compared to the DCU Center. And that being said, <clears throat> we can lower the ticket prices as well. We were charging $125 to attend the DCU Center function. And we're looking at lowering that and, and making it possibly seventy-five dollars to come. So it's a uh, it'll be a nicer evening. It'll be easy to get to, and we're hoping to fill the room up with uh, with people coming. Uh, we also looked at uh, some of the other challenges too in, in organizing things. So we we put together some subcommittees, and we're getting a lot of help. Uh, Steve D'Agostino is going to take care of all the, the media for us and and put some of that out on social media. In, in, our, in our newsletter and uh, newspaper and, and get it out there for us. And uh, Mauro Di Pasquale is going to uh, review all the, all the options for entertainment, the bands, and coordinate all the speakers this year, which is, which is going to be nice. Uh, we also have other folks stepping up, and, and uh, hand, uh, Donna's going to hand, handle the ticketing for us. And we talked about some of the other opportunities that are out there. Bidding for Good, which is an online bidding uh, program, you get that in someone's hands, and they can bid on, on, on items before they even show up to the event. Or if they're not going to be able to attend, they can bid on items online. So there's, other, there's all kinds of opportunities out there that we're considering and looking at. Um, one of the big things, though, uh, is, is for our fundraiser is the ability for our members and businesses in the community to help us out with our auction items. And with that, I'm going to have uh, Barbara talk to you a little bit about, about the auction, both silent and live auctions. Go ahead, Barbara. Okay, if we're going to have online biddings, we need to have auction items. And we need to have exciting auction items. Things that present well, things that are people that can use, uh, people, things that are kind of special. Some of the things that really go over well, obviously, are restaurant certificates, theme baskets. As you all know, I had a yard sale late this summer, and what did I find but some brand new martini glasses that I had put aside, I think, to make a basket for some auction, and I never got to it. So guess what I'm doing for this auction? 
doing a martini basket with my new martini glasses that I found. Um, getaways, getaways, um, sports things, anything that you can think of, but we need your help, we need your support. If you know somebody that has a uh, weekend getaway house and they would be willing to donate it for a weekend or for a week, those are the things that uh, really get, become very popular, particularly in the live auction. So we need a, not only nice looking things and things that people are going to use for the silent auction, but exciting things for the live auction. So we're, we've started this ahead of time from last year, so I hope that you'll be thinking of what you might want to contribute. If you have any questions, if you need any help, let me know. Um, you know, while you're doing your Christmas shopping, you'll find something that might go into a nice theme basket. You might find something on sale and stick it away to make that basket. Um, if you're in your favorite restaurant, ask if they would donate a gift certificate. All those kinds of things. Anybody have any other ideas? Please share them with me. And I really need your support and your help, and I want to thank you. Um, basically pushed me to get off the dime and, and um, say that I really was in favor of supporting Seven Hill School and the board voted in favor of um, doing a project this year for Seven Hills uh, Charter Public School um, and they've requested that we help them with a uh, digital library and Mike Barth is going to come up here and talk to you a little bit about uh, digital library in just a moment but I, I do believe um, that anybody who has been to that school um, feels very strongly that it's it's a great project for us that these kids are um, very needy uh, that the end result of, of an education at Seven Hill School is uh, well-educated kids who are going to succeed uh, and this just is better for Worcester's future uh, kids that are economically at the bottom end of the barrel are turning out to be great students. It's the American dream. Through education we can get out of this cycle of poverty. So Mike Barth if you'd come up. Thanks. I'm a little bit shooting from the hip here because Dave asked me five minutes ago to, uh, to talk a little bit about our literacy initiative and one of the um, things that Rotary can do to support that initiative at our school this year um, and um, th that will be something that will last for many years is, um, is providing um, the school with um, Kindles and loading those Kindles with ebooks, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that project and what that would look like. So we, we have about 91% of our students, I think I've mentioned this to you before, who are students of color in Worcester, and then about 200 out of 666 of our students are students who don't um, speak English as, a, as their primary language at home. So they're at a tremendous, um, disadvantage coming into the school in needing, in terms of needing access to a huge range of books. They, that's what they need. And so that is really our job as educators to do that. Um, and so this initiative will really just provide, just, um, I took some notes here, but just um, the, um, providing this exposure to rich texts through on these Kindles. Um, the, one of the things that's nice about Kindles is you can put just about, I don't know if anybody has a Kindle or an iPad or, or, or whatever in here, but you could put virtually as many books on a Kindle as you want. It almost, I mean, a book take, an e-book takes up very little space. Um, so a, a Kindle could have, I don't know, thousands, I guess, of books on it. Um, not that you would want that because you'd probably get a little lost in that. Um, but just providing that exposure to text. And then as it provides this flexibility where as um, students, uh, as uh, classroom needs shift, one Kindle could go into, um, could shift from one classroom to another just instantly, and all of a sudden that classroom now has exposure to all of those texts. One of the things that's happening in our literacy initiative this year is our scholars are coming in 
and devouring the, the books in the classroom. So our classrooms do have libraries, but the, the kids are coming in and, and just devouring them, um, especially the kids who are reading at lower levels because there, there aren't as many really rich texts at those lower levels, and so providing um, more, uh, more text in those levels is really important. Ebooks last forever is another really um, important thing to think about. Books, you know, physical books last a few years in a school, or you know, probably maybe a few, maybe you know, five, six years in a school before they get worn out. Also, um, it's, it goes without saying it's 21st century. So here we are. It's 2014, and we're still talking about like the 21st century. But um, the um, the MCAS, which you probably have been aware of as the state test for, for public schools, is, um, is, is going away. It's being replaced by PARC, and which is called Partnership for the Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers. So I'll give you a quiz on that later. It was PARCC. And PARC is now taken all online. So our scholars have to now move into a world of online testing. And that will be the measure that will hold schools accountable um, by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So, um, so that's really important that our scholars get those skills reading online um, to be able to uh, be successful on those, um, on those state tests. And I think I've gone through all of my notes that I wanted to talk with you about related to this. So, oh, 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 I did. I do, I do see that here. Right at the right before I walked up here, Krista said, tell them about the student that came in this morning. So we have a student at our school, as with any school, we have to take them all. And uh, we have a student at our school that has, that lives in an institution. And his, um, his out of school life is probably something that we can't even imagine. And, um, and he couldn't, we had a, we had a big program at, a, at our school last night, um, family literacy night. Our school was mobbed. Um, there were probably a thousand people in our school. It was just a fantastic academic event. Um, he couldn't come to that night because, um, because he doesn't have transportation from this institution that he's in. And so, one of the things that people could do last night was they could bring a book to donate to the school and for every book that they brought to donate they would get a coupon for 25 cents that they could then use to shop in the book fair which was open last night so kids could come to the family literacy night they could bring some books to donate get some coupons to be able to take into the book fair and shop for more books um, also there was this whole other component of the night, which was called Bingo for Books. It's this fantastic evening. I'd love to tell you more about it, but I won't. But this student, he couldn't come to that. So he showed up to school today, and he had his, his um, I don't know if it was a caseworker or somebody with him, and he had brought 205 books to school today. I couldn't believe it. It, was, it just took us all like by surprise. It was just this student, he's deeply troubled, and he's, he, he, he has been reached by this literacy program that we've done this year so much that he wanted to get what he, I think in his mind was $50 because he would get 25 cents a book. So he would get 200 divided by four. He would get $50 to be able to go into the book fair and, and shop for books. Um, so it was an amazing thing that he did that. Um, we, Krista, um, and I spent some time this morning going through the books and, and dividing them up into different levels for different classrooms throughout the school. And um, it was just, a, it's just amazing how, um, what the impact of this program that we're doing and it is on our scholars. Um, and it's reaching all of them, um, not only our high, high achieving scholars, but our, our lowest performing students. And um, so I just wanted to share that, and, um, and I just wanted to thank you if this project does move forward, um, because I think it is really important. So thanks. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Let's do it. Everybody raise your hands. No, I'm just, I'm just teasing Dave. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
No. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but these, these kids were up to the eighth grade. And honestly, there's a few boys that were taller than he. I uh, was so impressed to see how big some of those kids were. But most of all, I, I wanted to ask, um, I, I saw the girl who took me around, she was very attentive to me. And she, she was yeah. there for a purpose, and I, I could see it in her interaction. She was asking me questions about what I want to say, and, and so we did go to a few classrooms. And how organized those those kids were was, was very impressive. Um, the, Is that her? No. That, oh, okay. Uh, All right. <laughs> the one that took me around won the pumpkin uh, decorating contest. Oh, okay. I don't remember who that was. <laughs> uh, anyway, how do the students get into your school? Uh, are they just Worcester? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we have to have a waiting list um, because if we don't have a waiting list, then the state says to charter schools, well, then that's a problem if people don't want to come into your school. So we have a waiting list. We have, um, but it's a simple lottery. So the school is just, um, it's not something that you test into or, or have to do anything like that. You just have to, once you're a resident of Worcester, you put your name in the hat and um, there's a lottery process that happens and there's a certain number of seats in each grade that are allotted. So for instance, in kindergarten, there's 90, or there's 90 seats in kindergarten, there's 90 seats in first grade, and so on and so forth. And then it gets less as you get a little higher because there's attrition as students um, page through. Really the parents are the ones that put their names into the lottery system, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, right. Our kids are, our, our kids are children, so our, our kids are kids, so their parents are putting them in the lottery, yeah. And Krista could tell you how big our wait list is. I, it's 400 something. Yeah, oh, for 400 students on the wait list. Um, there, there is a way. Um, it virtually, virtually all of our students are from Worcester. Probably 99.5 percent. There is a way for a student who's outside of the city of Worcester to come to the school. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that is, but it's virtually all of our students are from Worcester. Yeah. <coughs> Some students um, would never get into the school if they don't get picked in the lottery. In, that happens every year. So, that, so it, it's a matter of if you put your name on the wait list and let's say, let's say 300 families, 300 students apply to come to kindergarten and the lottery picks 90 kids. So every year, all the, every year the new grade in our school is kindergarten, right? All the new seats open up for kindergarten. So it's a good example to use. So let's say 300 people apply and we pick those 90, and then 210 kids go onto a wait list. Um, that next year, um, those same 90 kids now go into first grade. But let's say 10 of those families or 20 of those families move out of Worcester or decide to go to Worcester Public Schools or leave the school for whatever reason. So you'd have those 20 seats open, so then you'd be able to go into that wait list of 210 and draw 20 seats of those kids who are now in first grade. So a lot of kids in charter schools who put their name on a wait list don't necessarily ever get into the charter school. Is this a lottery just for your school or is this a Worcester lottery it's just, for all the charter schools? It's just for Seven Hills Charter. This yeah. Each one, yeah, each charter school would have its own lottery. Yeah, my own kids go to a charter school in Marlboro and we had to do the lottery and um, yeah. Yes, sir. Does the wait list continue to grow? So if some kids are in there for K applicants and they, they weren't picked and they're rolled over, and then they join by a lot of other new, what, is, what I'm getting at is what are their chances of making At some point, Chris, these are really good questions for our superintendent. Um, at some point, the, um, at some point, you can't come into the school is my understanding, correct? No, okay. Krista could tell you. <coughs> yeah, these are really good questions for Krista. I don't really do a lot with the lottery, but I'll stay up here. Um, 
the, it used to be that the wait list rolled over from year to year. So parents, if you're number three on the list, then next year you're still number three until someone moves. But the state passed a new law last year. So starting this year, you need to reapply every year. So it's difficult for a parent who might have started out as number 10 and then got all the way up to number two and they start from scratch again next year. So most of our new students come in at kindergarten. If we do have students leave over the course of the year at different grade levels, we do refill those slots, but we don't have a huge amount of attrition at the school. So. Okay, so uh, stay up here in case it's about the wait list. <laughs> yes. Sorry to be um, That's okay. Financially, how, how, the, uh, how does the uh, school get do you want to answer that? I could, the, the school gets the finances like any other, um, like any other school in the Commonwealth does. So the um, it's a public school. Um, if there's a per pupil allotment that each child has in the state, and so when a student comes into our school, the Seven Hills gets that per pupil allotment, which I believe is about twelve thousand dollars and change per pupil. Is that correct? Yeah. So the money follows the kids wherever they go. Now there, there's an interesting thing, not to, not to draw on about this, but if you want me to stay up here longer, um, with all due respect. <laughs> um, when a student leaves Worcester and comes to seven, leaves the Worcester Public Schools and comes to Seven Hills, the money stays with the student and there's often been criticism that that means that it, the charter schools are taking money from the sending district like Worcester Public Schools in our case. Um, it's not true, it's a myth. Um, what, it, what actually happens is when a student comes to Seven Hills, the money follows the student so that the school gets the money to educate the child, but the state actually has a program where they, they pay in the first year that a student has left the main sending district, Worcester Public Schools, the state pays the Worcester Public Schools 100% of that per pupil allotment, so Seven Hills, the, so Seven Hills gets the, gets the money for that child, as well as Worcester Public Schools. The state double pays. In the second year after that child's gone from Worcester Public, it goes down to 75%, then it goes down to 50% in the third year, then in the fourth year it goes down to 25%, and only in the fifth year um, would Worcester Public Schools no longer continue to get money. For, so for four years, they're getting money for students that they don't even teach or have in their schools. Yes, sir. Uh, what's the, the actual difference between uh, charter school and public school? Charter schools are public schools, so the so um, there really isn't a difference. But if you said, what's the difference between a charter public a charter school and a non-charter school? So charter schools are public schools. So there's no difference. But a charter school and a non-charter school, there are there are a lot of differences. Um, Typically, charter schools don't have, um, don't have teachers unions. Um, they can, but typically they don't. And so everybody at a charter school is on a, is on a, con is on a one year contract. It allows the charter school to try, in my opinion, it allows the charter school to try many more innovative types of programs. For instance, we were able to extend our um, uh, reduced summer vacation for our scholars who regress significantly over the summer. Um, it's proven that it's a good thing for, um, for low income um, kids to have a shorter summer. We also have a school day that goes from 7.30 until 4.15 every day, and that's for K through eight. So we keep our students in our school. So our school year is reconfigured, our school day is extended, and, um, and that's just one example of the kinds of things that we can do in a charter school that would be very difficult to do in a school that might have like a, a, a national you know, teachers union behind it. Um, not that those things couldn't happen in a union school, but it's a little bit easier to do in a charter. That's one example of a difference between a charter and a non-charter. But we have... What? Why do we have charter schools? You're doing great. Yeah, you do. You want you want me to answer that? Okay. Why do we have charter schools? <laughs> well, charter schools were charter schools in Massachusetts have existed only since 1996. They're relatively new in the scheme of public education in Massachusetts, which would go back to you know the 1700s, I'm sure. Um, and so charter schools uh, were were allowed by law because I think. Cons my guess is, I don't really know, I, w I haven't been in charter school since that time. I, I was in 
you know, in my sophomore year of college in 1996. But I believe that charter schools came as a result of concerned groups of citizens in cities and towns that wanted an alternative to their town school that would be a public school paid for by their taxes, so it wouldn't require them to pay the tuition of a private school, um, but, would, but would be an alternative to their, um, to their um, town's public school system. So I believe that's what it was. But many of you could probably answer that question um, if you were around in 1996 when the charter school law was passed. Yes, sir. Um, part of the charter school movement was designed not only to give choice to families that might not have options in education, but also to be a breeding ground to develop best practices for public education and then share those best practices with other schools so we can all learn together. And so as part of our charter, we're required to disseminate any best practices that we develop at our school. So we do that in a number of different ways by hosting teachers and uh, pre-service teachers from the universities into the school to um, observe classes and debrief around things that they're seeing. We also present at conferences locally and nationally. And I think, Carl, the presentation you're referring to is one that I did last year at a national conference in Las Vegas. Um, about the board, one of the differences between a charter school and a traditional public school is the governance structure. Um, we do have a school committee, um, like the district school does, um, but we're just, it's, we are our own district and we have our own school committee and it's very small and there's a lot of local control and a lot of voice of all the constituencies on the in the school, so parents have a lot of voice, the teachers, the students, and the board really takes into consideration all of that information when making their decisions. And because we're so small, we can be responsive and proactive very easily. So part of my presentation in Las Vegas was about the board's role in school turnaround. And I presented there about the process that we use to try and uh, move away from uh, stagnant, uh, track record in terms of student achievement. Uh, the, under the state and the federal guidelines, the goals that the state and the national government set for the, each school go up every single year. And our school performance was flatlining. We weren't closing that gap of achievement, which urban schools are really working hard to do. And we just had a renewal inspection um, from the state, and it's about a 60-page report, and almost the whole report was positive. It talked about the vibrant community, it talked about a really strong curriculum, it talked about a committed staff, and so many great things that were happening at Seven Hills, and then it said, but their test scores are not what they need to be. And so we just thought we're doing everything that we know is good about education, but we're not getting the results. So how can we change that? And so we looked at other schools across the whole country who have similar demographics as we serve, who were achieving on standardized testing. And we did paper studies, we did online research, we called them, we visited several of the schools, interviewed students, parents, administrators, board members, and say, what are you doing differently than we are? here at Seven Hills and tried to identify a few key factors that are high impact. And we didn't see great instruction in other places that we thought we would see. We saw great culture. A great culture focused on goals, focused on future, focused on how everything we do today is preparing for a better day tomorrow. And we also saw a rich um, embracing of the cultures that the students come from and the diversity of the population that we serve. So everywhere, you know, on the walls, in the artwork, in the music, in the literature that they're reading, students saw themselves and their own histories reflected. And that was really empowering for those students. And so we brought back some of those best practices along with the longer school day, the longer school year, a very small student and classroom to administrator ratio, 
Um, our teachers are evaluated three times a year and they ha receive instructional coaching every single day in the classroom and so we brought back those best practices um, as a school. We worked as a school board and staff community to uh, decide which of those practices would be most impactful and well received by our community and how to move from point A to point B and manage that change process. And that's what we presented about in Las Vegas. Thank you. That was, you have an exhaustive website. <laughs> Samuel, go ahead. Uh, I'm sure. I have folks up the charter schools and non charter schools. I could my, my kids go to uh, to Abby Kelly. And one, Great. one thing I have observed about uh, charter schools, those kids are disciplined, they are focused, and they do well. Uh, and when I compare with non charter schools, I see different things. Mm -hmm. What do you do to discipline those children? You know, um, I'm going to let Krista talk, but one thing I want to tell um, that I was thinking about while you were talking is there is also a a myth out there that charter schools that may that may be some people might respond to your question if they didn't know what charter what Seven Hills does they would say well charter the reason why the kids are so focused and disciplined and well behaved is, and higher higher achieving is because the charter school if they don't like the student can just kick them out and they have to go back to the Worcester Public Schools and we'll take the next kid that comes on the list and it's completely not true at Seven Hills. We don't cherry pick at all, we're not allowed to, and we take anybody that applies into our school and we absolutely keep them there. So um, we believe in educating every single child that walks through our door and moving them forward. So um, the other thing I wanted to say that I thought of while Krista was talking was a difference between charters and, and, and um, non-charters is that charter schools are conditional schools. So a school in Worcester isn't really going to be closed. It could be taken over by the state if it was in really bad shape and put in receivership, but the school is going to stay there as the school. Um, in a charter school, a charter school has to meet every single year. It has to meet um, certain conditions, and that is the case for Seven Hills. And that's why it's so important that we continue our upward trajectory of making sure we're closing that achievement gap with our students who are, who are below um, proficient and um, making sure that you know they get too proficient um, as they go through their, their time. So we're not just moving them forward and, and keeping the gap the same, but we're actually closing that gap. That's a really important thing that charter schools have to do, that we have to do. And that's um, why we're level one, because that's what we do. And you could talk about these questions. I think it's really, I hear that all the time, that our kids are so well behaved and mannered. And I tell the teachers that and they're like, really? <laughs> um, because they work really, really hard at creating that environment and that culture. Many of the students, if you're doing well in the school you're in, why would you move? So most of the students who after kindergarten choose to come to Seven Hills is because they're not being successful frequently where they are. There might be some students who change because they don't, their parents don't feel they're being challenged enough, but that's rare. Most of the students come because they're on the cusp of being kicked out where they are, or because they're failing where they are, or because um, they're in self-contained discipline classrooms that are focused on behavior and not instruction and academics. So we have many students who've come to us for a fresh start and really to try and be embraced and valued as part of a community. So at Seven Hills, we try and focus less on discipline and more on character and community. So we have a very intensive character education program focused on school-wide core values. We have morning meetings every day where we talk about things like we give specific strategy training. How do you deal with annoying behaviors? So if you see a student doing something annoying, you don't pop them one, this is what you do. And we script them and we walk them through it and we practice it. So then when something happens and they're about to burst, we say, hmm, what did we talk about in the morning meeting yesterday? Or, so we pre-coach all of those strategies for dealing with things that could result in disciplinary action in the school so the students can manage their own behaviors and advocate for themselves and for their peers as part of a community. So, and always try and focus on the positive. Find the thing that really motivates each student and makes them special and makes them shine and build on that. I 
think it varies from school to school. Every district and every school has their own culture, their own philosophy, and you will see some of these same practices in other schools. I think part of it comes down to the culture of the community, but also the school leader. I was a district principal in Shirley for three elementary schools prior to moving to Worcester in, I don't know, many years ago. And um, we partnered with an agency out of Greenfield called Responsive Classroom. And philosophically, they were very well aligned with the type of work we're doing at Seven Hills. And so we had those same things in place in a public school, in a regular district setting um, elsewhere. So it does exist in other places, um, but it's just a big part of who we are at Seven Hills. Uh, I think, again, every public school is different, and there are different models of teaching across the board. And so we think a lot of what we do is innovative, but we do also big borrow and steal. You know, we try and disseminate our best practices, but we are chomping at the bit to find best practices from elsewhere. So some of the techniques that we use at our school came out of Teachers College, um, Columbia University, and New York, and from other places where we see good things happening, we try and learn from that. It's a real deal in charter school arena. Um, we, every charter school in Massachusetts operates on five-year charter terms. And so when you go to renew your charter in five years, if you have not met all of the criteria that the state has set forth for test scores and for everything else, then um, they can revoke your charter and you can get closed after five years. Sometimes they do it sooner, which is what happened with one of our charter schools here in Worcester last year, mid-year, um, the school closed down. Um, so it's a very precarious situation, and we take our work very seriously. Um, and one of the things that they can do, they can close you down, which does happen. Um, they can place you on probation. They can place you on conditions. And you're highly, highly monitored. I was a district school principal prior to coming here, as I mentioned. And I don't think anyone, from, I, I never saw anyone from the state come into the school. Here, I mean, they come in all the time and set up for weeks on end in our conference room and go and visit classrooms, call parents, interview parents, interview students. They look at every piece of paper I have ever written <laughs> with a fine tooth comb and meet with me and pick my brain about what I'm doing and why and what is the impact and how am I going to fix this. And um, It's a very, very highly scrutinized and rigorous process to maintain a charter. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other questions yes, you had asked. Teacher salary. Teacher salary. That varies school to school. Um, a lot of charter schools, you know, the teachers do work longer days and longer hours and actually get paid less. Um, in our school, when we build our budget at Seven Hills, after we put in the fixed costs for, you know, the rent for the, or the mortgage for the building and electricity and things like that, the first thing we do is teacher salaries because we know that's what matters the most in terms of impacting children is having great teachers in those classrooms. We wish we could pay them a lot more than we do. Um, but the way that we do it at Seven Hills is we use the Worcester um, public school salary schedule for initial placement based on education and years, excuse me, years experience. And we add 2,000 to it. So honestly, they, instead of working 180 days, our teachers work 210 and $2,000 is nothing to compensate all that extra time and energy they put in. Um, we also do compensate them for that. They get that for ten, uh, 200 days. The additional 10 days of summer is a stipend, um, that, but they, every single one of them participate. Um, so it's comparable to the district schools, but they do work a longer day and a longer year. But the other thing that happens is that's their base salary their first school year. 
And then every year they're evaluated and based on their evaluation determines the percent increase from year to year. So when you're in a district school, it's all, okay, you're a year three, you go up this much. You're a year four, you go up this much. In our school, it's based on your evaluation. It's not based on you get an automatic increase every single year. Um, but the evaluation is a very collaborative, inclusive process that the teachers participate in all year long. So it's not that there are any grievances or surprises. I think it's, it's always worked very well, and they appreciate the recognition for their hard work. afterwards, but we're running out of time for okay. the meeting. Thank you. And we have a few other cut things to cover. Um, I think we're... I think, I think we're going to be hearing from uh, Mike and Krista all year long. Um, this, this, you know, every time, the more I hear about the school, the, the deeper I, I, I feel we should be contributing. Uh, it's just a... Uh, um, it, it's... It amazes me that uh, they care so much. Interestingly, uh, California is um, introducing, uh, I don't know whether it's legislation or a referendum, to do away with tenure in the public schools. And we think about it, why should we have tenure in the public schools? What does a tenured school teacher think about changing their curriculum or working harder every day? So um, do you have tenure over there? <laughs> Everybody works year to year, apparently. Yeah, um, it's great what incentive can do. Um, I just happened to ask a teacher about turnover while I was there, and um, her comment was that there had been a great deal of turnover, but that. Um, it, it was over because um, they're now carefully uh, hiring teachers who care about the kids, and, and you can see it in the classrooms. It's, it's immediately apparent that's different. But what strikes me all the time is the kids. They, they're just, I don't understand how they can um, live in poverty and come to school and be, be so happy. Maybe it's they get away from poverty for a little bit, but. Um, the, nobody seems to be able to tell me precisely what the poverty level is in Worcester, but everybody thinks it's for a family of four, it may be $2,000. Uh, I'm sorry, 20000 a year. Um, how do you live on 20000 a year? How do you pay rent? How do you buy food uh, for a family of four on 20000 a year? That's incredible. Um, anyway, we are trying very hard to have a successful um, fundraising project to get this digital library um, sometime in March and we think that one of the ways that we might accomplish a better stronger fundraiser basically get more money um, is if we start working on the glue party in the past we've always had a big turnout from past members at the glue party we now have a whole litany of material largely because of uh, Steve D'Agostino, that comes out every day to our members. Wouldn't it be nice to send that to past members? Um, and and kind of introduce, not get them to join Rotary so much as to feel a part of what we're doing here. Um, so Barbara Guthrie and I have been spinning our wheels about how to go about that for quite some time. Barbara's doing the work and I'm spinning my wheels. But um, we need to, we, we need to find contact information. And also, we'd be very interested in knowing who you'd like to see at the Glug Party. Now, the Glug Party, Seven Hills, Public Charter, Seven Hills Charter Public School has offered to have their choir here at the Glug Party. So we're going to make it a big deal this year. Um, we're gonna, and we're, we're going to try to get a bigger turnout and, and make it a bit more fun. So be ready, Bank. You're going to have to be um, brewing a lot more stuff. Barbara, do you want to talk about what you're doing for names? I think those of you who have email, received an email from me yesterday, 
uh, with a list of, I went through the old members uh, that are listed on Club Runner, and some of them I know have moved or have passed away. Some of them I did not know. Uh, some of them I don't have the contact information. So I put the list together and sent it out to you and ask your help and if you could look over that list, fill in any information that you might know of. Um, and George has already come back to me with some information, so I'm very appreciative. So we'd like to have a nice list of people that we can send out that invitation to for the Glurg party, have them come back, uh, some of our old members, and some new members, or some new folks, people that you think might be interested in joining Rotary. Uh, we'll put our best foot forward that day and, and have a nice event and um, maybe attract some new members as well and to get them to come to some of our events, particularly the fundraiser that will be happening in March. I also in that email asked, and I've asked this before, if you have any information, we want to send out uh, some letters to some companies um, kind of stimulating them to think about having some of their people join Rotary. And up here I have a list of some companies, but I'd love to hear from you folks, any businesses or corporations that you think might be a good um, fit for Rotary members, if you could provide some information on that so that we can get those letters out probably after the holidays. So I thank you again for your support. Any questions? Barbara, how far back did you go on our old number list to put together your list yourself? Well, it was interesting because when I looked at the list, um, there were a lot of members that I knew had been members of Rotary that weren't on that. And then, as, again, as I say, there were some people I know have passed away, so it, it was very mixed. And Dave provided me with some old um, membership lists that I looked over last night, and some of them, it was, I think, 1994-95 and 2005-2006. I went through some of those and picked out a few more names. Uh, but some of them were, were pretty old, so I don't think they were relevant. Um, you went back to 94, 95. Yeah, yeah. But if, if there are names that aren't on that I list... Went back to old too. <laughs> <laughs> well, not everybody is we as strong and virile as you are. <laughs> what did you say, Please, if there's somebody on there that's not on there that you think you know you'd love to see come to the Glurg party or might be interested, let me know. Yeah. I have a collection of all the old rosters. That would be great. That'd be great. Well, I don't think we've totally figured it out, but I think all of the above, I mean, if we have email addresses, we can send, send we'll have a flyer uh, and send that out to them. I think if you personally know someone, for instance, I think I mentioned I ran into Al Swenson in the grocery store a few weeks ago, and I said, oh, we're going to have a word party and we're going to send out invitations. He was all excited, would love to come. So I think there's a lot of different ways that we can approach people. but. Email addresses, if we don't have emails, maybe their home addresses. And then, again, invitation, personal invitation works great. So all of the above. Well, well get us the names and we'll put them on the, uh, the email list. Um, I, think, I think if they see what we're doing here, uh, I just think they might be interested in coming. Uh, we're doing so much more. Uh, and I think we'll have the uh, flyer for the um, fundraising event ready by then that we can have available too so that we can spread the word. Okay. Thank you. 50-50 uh, drawing. Sandra, would you pick a number, please? She's got the... <laughs> yep, last three numbers. No winners?
I'm uh, not trying to replicate MTV by having uh, a film running here, or a bar room, for that matter, uh, or a sports bar. But um, Steve D'Agostino sends out uh, pictures or, or a film clip uh, that we can access through our emails for every meeting. And um, I don't often open them. And I thought it would be a nice opportunity for those of you who haven't been to Seven Hills to get a sense for what we were doing. Um, if you want to hear what they're saying, all you have to do is open your email, click it on, and the link will bring it to you. These, these clips are also going to um, the local telev television station, and they're, being, they're carried on the air. Uh, I don't know what the schedules are for those shows. They're on the web. Aren't they eventually going on the air? Okay. All right, so if you go on to their web page. But it's easier to go into your email, find the email that Steve sent you, click on the picture, and you'll get the whole story of what the meeting you missed. That doesn't mean you're going to miss meetings, though, does it? It's going to be here. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a strong sentiment for having the fundraiser here because, you know, a lot of people just don't want to go over to the um, convention center. Um, the, the parking here is convenient. If we get um, 250 people in this room, um, I think we'll do have a much more successful drawing. And that's going to be the theme that we want you to bring people. We want you to come, we want you to bring your spouses, and we want you to bring your friends. Frank Doherty. Dave, do we have a date on the gala fundraiser? Um, what is it? March 14. March 14. March 14. Thank you. And uh, I don't think that we, that's uh, cast in stone for Bob this morning. I don't think we've uh, locked in that date here. But we're about 90% there. Um, December 18, is that right? Thank. It's your party. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you all for your patience with no speaker, but I think we had a lot of fun here today. Carl, you have a question? One real quick note. Um, with the blessing of Val Callahan, we launched in our district the formation of a Rotary Wine Appreciation Fellowship. On your table are flyers that discuss it, and you can apply uh, either online or directly. Um, it's $100. We're going to do respectively four or six events a year. We're trying to have some fun within our district because of all the hard work everyone does. And there's going to be some committees, so that if we're going to be successful, we need people to come in and work together. And I'd like to give a special shout out to Steve D'Agostino and all the hard work he's done. Here's this. And, and we have a good idea, so uh, I hope we get a lot of members. Oh, there's one last thing. Um, the first 10 members. Uh, the president of the Wine Fellowship Association will match your $100 donation with another $100, and he will send that into Rotary Foundation to Polio Plus in your name. Has it been brought up before the board? It was brought up through District Governor Val It's a It's a found, district foundation project, but no, I'll have the board look at it as well. I think, but. I think All right, we'll do that. I agree. Um, I, I, I find it, you know, we'll, we'll follow the process, but the wine, dis, uh, the, what do you call it, the wine, what? The Wine Appreciation Fellowship. The Wine Appreciation Fellowship comes from uh, Rotary International as a, found, as a means of raising money for the foundation. I'll get you some more, more information on it. I think this was a great meeting. Um, I didn't miss the speaker at all. Uh, actually, we had two very helpful speakers that um, really told us uh, a lot more about why we're trying to help them. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.